Welcome to the Lancaster Patriot Podcast. My name is Chris, Managing Editor of the Lancaster Patriot, joined today by Dave Stoltzfus, CEO of the Lancaster Patriot. Dave, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Luke Saint, author of The Sound Doctrine of Theocracy and the chairman of the Mid-Atlantic Reformation Society. Luke, thanks for joining me. Thanks again, Chris. And Joel Saint, pastor of Independence Reform Bible Church. Joel, thanks for being here. Always good. All right, we're going to talk about the Amish today. We are here in Lancaster County, the heart of Amish country, if you will. And Dave... You were raised Amish. I was. Okay. I was. That's what are your right. What are your favorite memories of being raised Amish? Uh, oh, that didn't take long. Man, <laughs> right away he goes into that. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I really don't know what my favorite memories were. I mean, I I, uh, I look back and I like the uh, the work ethic. I, I you know now I'm not sure that I enjoyed it then. I didn't enjoy uh, you know working in the hog barns and uh, you know, chicken houses and stuff like that, but probably the work ethic is one of the the strongest things that stick out to me um, in the Amish community yeah in in today's society that's that's just something you don't find yeah 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 a lot lot of good things I think we'll talk about some of those and we also want to talk about is is the Amish way the way of the future as far as the Christian path forward there are some thinkers out there saying that we need to mirror what the Amish have done we need to create a parallel economy. We need to look at the Amish model, and that's that's the path forward. So we want to talk about that a little bit. Joel, you've been in this area for quite a long time. When you think about the Amish, what, do, what are your initial thoughts on their way of life, what they've been able to do here, and maybe some challenges as we get into this? There were, in, in, in past jobs, past professions, I worked extensively with Amish folks. One of the things that at least one of them, well, a few of them would talk to me about this because a lot of the Amish folks that I knew didn't know their history, but some did. And one of them, um, a businessman that I knew, he would talk about the fact that back in the back in the forties, uh, the Amish drove cars, and the problem was not that they have a, they don't have a problem with driving a car; they have a problem with a driver's license, and they had a, and, and according to him. They first had the problem with the cars and went back to went to the uh, horse and carriage, if you will, was because they didn't want to go to the world to get a uh, to get a license, which um, sounds kind of more and more interesting to us as as time goes on. Another thing like uh, that that they don't really they don't have a problem with is the electricity. Now, of course, Weird Al Yankovic in his uh, in his spoof uh, Amish Paradise. He, he he starts out by saying, "As I walk through my fields, as I harvest where I harvest my grain, mm-hmm. I take a look at my wife and realize she is very plain." He says, "But that's uh, what's he say? That's just perfect for an Amish like me. You know, I shun fancy things like electricity, right?" Wow, you got the thing memorized. Man. <laughs> it's 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 pretty catchy, right? So, but I mean, they don't is shun he still, electricity. Is he still alive, by the way. Weird Al, yeah, the guy's got to be eighty. Oh, I don't know. No, he's, still, he's not that old. Yeah. He's still doing his thing. He's still touring. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think I, can, I think he's late sixties. Actually, um, he's been doing this since he was like eighteen years old. But anyway, um, that's not actually true. They don't shun electricity. What they shun, as I understand it, is the world. They don't want to dependent be dependent on the world for their electricity. So they'll do other things like. Um, uh, you know, batteries and so forth, and 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 solar uh, generators. Am- Amish will do, yeah, generated gas massive generators, gen- diesel, that kind of thing. massive diesel generators. Yeah, yeah, and so they so they utilize electricity. They're trying to get away from the world, if you will, which again sounds kind of interesting. The problem is for the and, and this again, this is another con- uh, uh, discussion I've had with some Amish, because some have said we we can't get away from the world now. There, there's, there's too much interaction. Uh, we're selling to the English. That's that's us. We're selling to the English. We're interacting with the English an awful lot. And if all of a sudden the English went away, we Amish don't know what don't know what we would do. When we're talking about co- pa- a parallel economy, it seems to me the Amish is the closest thing that we have to it. And in my conversations, even they are saying, I don't really know if we can be a par- parallel economy. Because, because of our dependence on everyone else, okay. okay, who are not Amish, okay, all right, Luke. What are your initial thoughts on the Amish? Yeah, on anything. Weird Al Yankovic, the Amish. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, we're, 
Weird Al, um, I think. Yeah, let's uh, talk about Weird Al. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 first, the first thing that I remember about Amish Paradise was something, you know, Dad, you remember pointing this out to us that um, as we were young and we were talking about Amish Paradise, um, Dad kept asking us, what is the one thing that he says in that, uh, he says in that music video or that song that's, that's not true? And we kept going to, to like, I don't know. I mean, and, and um, Weird Al talks about a lot of things, you know, churning butter, you know, uh, <laughs> hitch up the horse and buggy, all that kind of stuff, you know, yelling at tourists who kick him in the butt and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and, and we just, and, and uh, we couldn't get what it was that dad was trying to communicate to us that that's not accurate. And the thing that dad pointed out to us was he says, when I have a Bible in my hand, and uh, we were like, what? I mean, all the Amish are, you know, these super religious and Christian people. And dad was like, actually, some of them are and some of them aren't. You know, not everyone is a, uh, I think at that point you were saying most of them didn't read their Bible. That, you know, that they, he said, I have yeah, a Bible I, I in my hand. I would say that the, the Amish man that knows what's in the Bible is more the exception than the rule. Right. I, I don't know if you, how you'd feel about that, Dave. Oh, I would agree. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's, it's more or less Catholicism light is what i've always said right you know, right the problem is they do, it's german and and if you're if you're if your natural language is, is french and you're reading a german bible or english there's going to be there's going to be some problems with that right 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 and are they as dogmatic as the catholics are about that like everything's got to be in german do they ever read are there are oh yeah, there? yeah yeah but not church service not in church service okay yeah. all right and and I remember, they, I remember when my dad got an esv it was almost heresy you know, uh, it wasn't a King James. Oh, uh, that was like was well, easier to read. <laughs> Argue with that. No, no, in in their sermons, do they? Is the whole thing in German, or oh, yeah. is it yeah. okay? All right, yeah. all right. And and they they won't do like what the Catholics did, like just read the Bible in German and give the rest in English. No, no. Okay, all right. So that was the thing that Dad pointed out to us that that uh, helped us understand the Amish a little bit more. And I think that's something that the world needs to understand about the Amish too, is that they think they're all super, you know, uh, you know, Bible knowledge, you know, but I guess the, the consensus is no, actually they, they, a lot of them don't know what's in the Bible. Um, uh, but growing up around the Amish, you know, w one thing that I noticed about the Amish is that they're soup. They are very unassuming. I I never feel uncomfortable about the Amish. I never feel like I'm about to be taken advantage of. The until very you buy a lawnmower. Until right, I buy a lawnmower. <laughs> and here's the thing about buying a lawnmower from them: they beat their equipment to death. So if you're going to buy something used from Amish, I'd say do not buy a used from Amish because they beat their stuff to death. Now they don't lie about it. They'll tell you, yeah, we beat it to death. But um, just don't buy equipment from them. <laughs> that's that's my thoughts on the Amish. Dave, anything you want to add to that sort of the spiritual picture there, uh, the religion, if you will? And I want to get into then this idea of parallel economy and is is the Amish the way to go? But first, someone who's who grew up there, anything you want to add to what Luke said there? No, I mean, it, the thing with the Amish is, and I always say it, is they're Catholic light. Most people think the Amish broke off of Presbyterians or Lutherans or something like that, but they really did break off of Rome. Uh, and, and they brought a lot of their a lot of their church politics with them. Um, and like Joel said, back in the 40s, they were actually, so if you think about it, 100 years ago, they were the same as the rest of society. You know, the rest of society was, was driving horse and buggies, stagecoaches or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, and then cars came into play. They did drive cars for a while. So it was really in the 60s, I think, when, when they kind of had this split and they said, look, we, we got to we got to stop progress here. So, officially, the Amish stop progress, but unofficially, you know, their houses are wired now with solar, and and they're 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 actually more eco friendly than probably most of the green um, clowns in New York City and yeah. DC <laughs> that, that are flying <laughs> private jets to, uh, to all these conferences all yeah, over yeah, the place. Yeah, they got ten beach houses, you know, yeah. that, that are going to be flooded in five years. Yeah, but anyhow, no. As far as the Amish, I mean, they they. The, the, the spiritual assessment that I would say is is the, this, this next generation, the generation that would be after me, is probably, they're probably the ones that are looking and seeking the most. And there are some, there's some reformed theology going on in different places. 
among the Amish? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there there was one one Amish bishop in in general that that had Gary North stuff on his on his you know in his bookshelf. Um, he was he was he was you know Rush Dooney, American Vision. He was he was hardcore, mm. and and he still is. Uh, but he kind of got pushed out. Okay. So, at, okay. The, at the end of the day, that's kind of what happens when you when you deviate from the um, more hard line. I, I don't want to equate them to to the Muslims, you know, with with their different sects, but they are kind of that way. So here in Lancaster County, if you're, I would say, if you're south of uh, Strasburg, you know, southern end of the county, you're much more hard line. Uh, where it's more about the Amish way of life and less about Christ, uh, whereas maybe in in the northern uh, parts of the county it's more about Christ. But then you have you have hotbeds of of just we're just Amish. I mean, it just is what it is. Do the do the Pikers associate themselves with the Amish? No, I mean, but they'd be Anabaptists. You know, we we could put this into the whole Anabaptist world, whether it's Hutterites or or Pike Mennonite or. Uh, even even the even the communist Mennonite, yeah, you know, they, they 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 to some degree have the same mentality. It's not just the Amish, I would say. It's it's the Anabaptists, it's the Anabaptist uh, in in general in whole. Well, people are some people are drawn to this idea of of the parallel economy, and I think that's a good segue. Maybe this idea of that one bishop who started getting into whether it's Christian Reconstruction theonomy. And ended up being run out, if you will, because can that that unofficially that, unofficially right? Well, that's certainly not the mindset among the Amish or the Mennonite that we ought to look at civil government and seek to have it be conformed to Scripture, right? It's Correct. it's we we just exist here as pilgrims and strangers, Hebrews, yep. right? And so that's what I want to talk about now. Can because there are Christians out there saying, well, in our nation now. The way we need to go is the way of the Amish. We need a parallel economy. So, or or they're saying the Amish are the way. They're going to outpopulate everyone else. But I mean, if they have a if 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 the theology is wrong and the worldview is wrong, what good are we doing? You know, yeah, we could yeah. be doing could be doing worse. We could make be, things yeah, worse. Absolutely. You know, I mean, if you still have a totalitarianism going on, whether it's whether it's inside the Amish church or outside, uh, I would say to some degree that's inside the church. So now we just have, uh, now we have Rome 2.0. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to, I want to play this brief clip. Uh, we've covered other Amish men on this podcast, Amos Miller, Reuben King. Uh, this is a case in Virginia. And I just want to play a brief clip of this so people can hear what's happening there. Cause I think it's going to play into what we really want to talk about here is, is can, can this parallel economy idea work if you have statism <clears throat> in the nation? So let's listen. This is just three minutes. We'll play this and then we'll talk about it. I wasn't on the form at the time. And then they tagged the meat so that we can't touch it. We can't sell it. We can't feed our family with it. We can't do anything with it. To me, that was quite wrong that we can't feed our family with it or at least give it to people. I even made a special phone call to ask him again if that's the way it is. He said, yes, you cannot feed your family with it. You cannot do anything with it. I decided this ain't right. We're going to feed our family. We're going to feed our customers. We did not honor that tag. We sold the meat. We sold some meat out of there, whatever customers ordered. Then the state came back and they saw what we did. Really gave me a mouthful for doing that. But hey, basically what they did was they took it to court. They took a lot of pictures of whatever they could here to form to find evidence that we're slaughtering and selling raw meat and took it to court in order to seize the product and put it in the dump. Later that day, they came out here with the U-Haul truck, backed it right off here to the door and took two men four hours to get it out. And they just loaded it on a U-Haul truck and took it out to a dump and dumped everything out. They got all the meat except pet food and wild game packs of ground turkey. Everything else they took. When After the war, they had a tag that we can't do anything. We can't take any meat out. We can't feed our family. We can't give it away. Can't feed it to dogs. We can't do anything with it. How does that make you feel if you can't even feed your own family with your own meat? 
if we're allowed to do it or not, we definitely will. Anybody can go and raise animals for their own family to eat. That's where I got to the point, he crossed the lines, so I'm gonna cross the lines. He crossed the lines by telling me I cannot feed my own family with this meat. So I decided I'm gonna cross the lines, I'm gonna sell it. That's why I didn't honor the state. How has this affected your daily operations and your family at large? Uh, it definitely affected us because all of a sudden we weren't selling meat and that really put my sales down and then we started selling again. So we've been selling meat for a few weeks and then they came out and took everything and we had to quit again. So it just takes some time before we got the stuff stocked back up. We don't have the cash flow coming in. We had all this meat. We worked hard to get it in the freezer, process it, package it, stack it in there to sell and bring income. And here comes the state and puts everything in their truck and takes it to the dump, pays us nothing for it. So that definitely affects our income. And we do have a big struggle to pay our bills right at the moment. but. We are stocking the freezer back up and trying to get back on the normal as soon as possible. All right, that was from Town Hall. That's the story of a man named Samuel B. Fisher down in Virginia. And it's very similar to the Amos Miller case here in Lancaster County, where you have a man who was selling organic or natural meat, and the state comes in and take, takes all his, his food away. So parallel economy right there isn't going to work too well with statism. Luke, uh, you've written a lot about statism. Any comments on that? I don't know if you saw the whole the whole clip, or you just saw that. Oh, no, I I, I watched the whole thing. Okay, yeah. What what were your thoughts on that? Uh, um, you know, the the I often rail against the legislator, but it, it's it's not exclusive to the legislator. It's it's the idea that man can that man can legislate at all because now all three branches are basically legislating with executive orders. Um, and Supreme Court law rulings that we treat like law, but are, but are not law. But all three branches are, are, are legislating. And so, uh, you know, when I when I talk about the the dangers of a, a, having a legislator, it's not exclusive to the actual um, branch of uh, a legislature. It's 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 the concept that man has the authority to legislate outside of God's law, and this is the danger. Of general equity theonomy um, that says, okay, we have we have an idea, we have a law from from uh, from God, but we can take that law and make and write laws that are similar to it that basically enforce this idea, and so the law becomes an idea, and and your ideas become law. That's that's the danger of general equity theonomy when we treat that as a legislative. Um, a, a, a legislative um, uh, permission when we treat it as like, okay, uh, I get the general idea from God's law, and now I make my own laws off of that. And uh, th this is the this is the danger that we give uh, to the government. Uh, it's it's not restricted to the legislative branch because the executive branch creates all these departments and basically allows them to legislate outside of the legislature and then we have all of these really ridiculous regulations and codes and ordinances and uh, and which are all basically treated like law because they have they care they all carry penalty right. and uh and then you have things like the fda so i mean once once you give the executive branch authority to basically reproduce it will and um it, it will start um, you know when you're not fighting a war against a visible enemy out there, you're going to start fighting an invisible war against uh, an invisible enemy in here. And uh, why else would you waste so much good resources? Uh, why why else would you attack this man who's just selling? I mean, wh what kind of law? What kind of law is it um, really when at the end of the day, the person enforcing the law can just can just be like, yeah, whatever, you know. What, what what kind? I mean, what kind of law is that? Do you find yourself enforcing when push comes to shove? If you just go, eh, that's all right, you know. Then then it, it, should that be really be a law? You know, none of God's law is like that. None of God's law, like if you violate God's law, 
it's not like this, eh, whatever. You know, because God restricts his law to things that are actually serious, serious violations. But when you get into statism, there's so many laws that most of them come down to, eh, whatever. I mean, if you just go whatever, it doesn't make a difference. You know what I'm saying? It's not a real law. And uh, the, the, the danger of, um, of legislating outside of God's law, as we see here, is not restricted to the legislative branch. Right. And so when you talk about general equity, and, and I think you've mentioned this in your book, if you don't have a copy, Get the Sound Doctrine of Theocracy by Luke Saint. So you, you talk about general equity and adjudication, not legislation. Here's an example where you could say, okay, we're, we're applying the principle maybe of, you know, don't, don't murder, don't harm someone. And so we're going to make all these rules about how you sell your meat because this is, this is for, for health. This is for the love of life. Right? I mean, that's how it's some justified. people justify yes, it. It's right. justified. And, yeah. and, and then, but this is what happens then inevitably. Yes. The, the federal or the state government, mm -hmm. I think in this case, will say, well, we're going to take your stuff. I mean, this is from another website saying that his, his property and livestock was taken as well. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but definitely they confiscated all that meat. So, you know, this is the parallel economy being destroyed mm -hmm. by the statists. So, so Joel, can the parallel economy work if you don't try to change the culture around you and, and the, and the, the civil government? Yeah. I, I love the idea of the parallel economy. Uh, the idea of the parallel economy is that I can be left in peace. Uh, there, uh, the, you know, Christ talks about the thief coming to steal and to kill and to, and to destroy. And we know the thief isn't going to quit. And, and all, while there's something left to kit, while there's something left to be stolen or alive or can be destroyed, the thief will be busy uh, during that time. Uh, the, the desire is just just to be left alone. We and, and that's what we all feel. Like, please, can you please just leave me alone? It's human nature. Uh, sure, it is. I I, I want to work. I want to support my family. And w without without paying for, for example, a, an education that I don't want, for example, mm -hmm. for um, status education, I don't want it. I don't need it. It has nothing to do with me, and it's frankly destructive. And I don't want to be a destructive person. So, can you leave me alone? So, I would I would actually start discussing the parallel economy from that standpoint. If we're going to do a parallel economy, can we start by getting out of state sponsored education taxes? property taxes. Can we start there? And I would argue that if we can't handle property taxes that support this ghoulish and horrific um, state education system, I don't know how we're ever going to have a parallel economy. The Amish still, they, they haven't gotten out property taxes, have they? Oh, no, they pay, they yeah. pay property taxes. Yeah, yeah. Can't get out of that. Uh, I mean, it, they, but they have their own schools. Right. Right. They have their own schools, <clears throat> so they, they have their own children to educate, but they... So, so, so they have their children, but they don't have their money. At Correct. least not the Correct. tax money. That's right. The state has their money. That's right. So it kind of works out well for the state, right? It does. It does very well. We, yeah. we, we get your money and don't have to mess with your kids. Correct. So yeah, so the thing I want us to talk about is can, can this Amish way of life, and there's other, we can look at other communities. I mean, can that lead to the advancement of Christian culture? Is that something we, we can look at and say, this is the model we need to have? Because can, can the Amish even exist outside of a, a Christian, a larger Christian society, right? I don't think yeah. so. I mean, they've, they got kicked all over Europe, you know, nine, ten, nine, ten generations ago. Mm. They got kicked from Germany to Switzerland to Holland, and then they finally ended up over here. Which the Calvinists had been here for almost 100 years yeah, prior and, to that. And so finally they were able to live in peace for almost, what? Uh, 300 years? Yeah, yeah, a couple hundred years now. Yeah, a few, few hundred, sure. Uh, yeah. You know, so... So I think I think that mentality that uh, pilgrims and wanderers on the earth is is uh, well we'll just we'll just pick it up and and go somewhere once the once the persecution starts. All right. Mm -hmm. The problem is, uh, what do you do then when you run out of places to go? In other words, where would the Amish go now? The, you know, this this gentleman here from Virginia, where is he going to go? Belize. Well, yeah, no, but even that, I mean, you're 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 no longer the world is now a it's much smaller. Than what it was back then. You know, is, is that another way of saying the state, the state apparatus is has a much larger, yeah, yeah, has a much <laughs> much longer reach? Probably, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. we're in the same we're in the same position as the reformers were with the Catholic Church. 
the Catholic Church was everywhere. It was just everywhere. There was no, there was no ecclesiastical function that was not affected by it. It was all over the place. The New World, the Old World, Catholicism was everywhere, and um, you just couldn't escape it. And it's just, we're in the same position today. State, statism, statism, you just can't an, escape is, it. Is the new Catholicism? Is the new Catholicism? Yeah, you, you, yeah. you mentioned that in your book that yes. we need the Reformation. We had the Reformation in the Church. Yes. And this is what Abraham Kuyper said too. Kind of like we haven't had it. In, we actually haven't had it in, in this government yet. No, no. And and you know we we, I mean, it's statism is is basically secular Catholicism because um, the, the the Catholic Church was doing something similar, except they were they were saying, okay, here's a new sin, here's a new sin, here's a new sin, new sin, new sin. New sin. They're legislating here. legislating sin, and the and the um, the. Uh, Protestants rightly rejected that and said, "You can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. You don't have the authority to make those decisions for everybody." Um, and and that's why I believe to 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 be theonomic is to be is to be reformed is to be theonomic. I'm not going to be like, "Oh, you're only truly reformed if you're if you're theonomic." I believe if you're consistent, you are theonomic because as the same way that we reject the Pope's authority to legislate sin, we need to reject the state's authority to legislate crime. And uh, the the the, uh, the Protestants, I, I think, haven't gotten there yet. But that's one reason why we do this podcast. That's one reason why we're writing books. And, and I think I think I think it's just a human human nature problem, though. When you look at it, I mean, Christ Christ was battling those same problems with the with the with the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah, they right. were they were legislating. Yes. Yeah. So it went from it went from there to Roman Catholicism to statism. To statism. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, and th their legislation turned out to be evil. And interestingly enough, to, to, to well, Luke's ours point is e here. Ours is evil, too. Uh, exactly. So so here's the thing. We think, and this this is what's, uh, this is where my thinking has changed here in the, over the last few years. We think we can also legislate righteously. Was there ever a time when Christ ran into Pharisee, Pharisee legislation where he said, good job. Okay, that's not, it was, it is written, but well done. You guys came up with something on your own, and it works. It didn't happen. That is something we just have to think about around here. When we're writing off our own legislation, and in this case, this gentleman from, you know, Amish gentleman from Virginia, the legislation is evil. There are people that were counting on those goods that the state destroyed, and now they don't get them. This is evil and wicked stuff. This isn't like like you were saying a little bit early, Luke. Like, well, you know, hey, you know, we write legislation. Hey, there's good, there's bad. Who knows? No, it's bad. Yeah, and it's bad every time. Yeah, every yeah. time. And, and, and again, can we think of any place, even in Scripture, where we got away from the the, the, the law of God? We wrote our own, and it was like, okay, well, now we've improved things. Has, yeah. has that ever happened in scripture? Has it ever happened in history? And 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 many Americans will say, yeah, yeah, with a great experiment, yeah, America. Yeah, we we improved in the Bible. With, yeah, with, yeah, and they'll call it the greatest government that's ever existed. Yeah, okay, but I, I want to ask you, Dave. Um, okay, this Amish farmer here in Virginia, it looks like he's on his own. What would happen if the Amish Church? Because the Amish Church is somewhat a centralized system, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, they fought the they fought the public schools. They, you know, back in the sixties. Yeah, they 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 went to jail for it. And how they do it? The bishops got together and said, yeah. "We're not doing we're not this, doing right?" It. Yeah. Okay. What if the bishops got together here and supported this Amish? See, I, I don't think it's going to happen. No, and, but and, but that's what they should do. I mean, that's but but I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we should all be doing. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. That's my, that's my question. Sure, sure. What if what if the professor? Okay. Let's see. Let's just say the professing Protestant church that hasn't been given over to uh, rainbows and 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 nonsense. Okay. What if that church stood up and said, "You know what? Uh, you're wrong to charge us property taxes. We're not going to pay them anymore. Or we're not going to. It's not that we're not going to pay them anymore, but we are going to preach from our pulpits as." A Protestant denomination, well, it's not a denomination, but as a, as a prominent sect, if you will, or section of Christianity, we're not going to do this anymore. In other words, what I'm saying is I don't think the individuals can create a parallel economy. I don't think it can happen without the support of the institutional Protestant church. If it had that, I think it would have a shot. Without it, 
they pick they, they, they pick off the individuals one by one. And the pastor's standing around saying, well, hey, you know what? If you want to do this, it's up to you. A little bit like they do with the vaccination, right? Like, oh, mm. you know, if you want to do that, it's up mm. to you. And they should have been saying no. You know, <laughs> we, we're the ones that have been screaming about smoking all these years, right? How horrible <laughs> it is. Now we're going to stand by while you, you know, go, put poison direct. Forget about your lungs. You can put poison directly into your system now. And we're, that's up to you. Well, well you, where were you when we were talking about smoking all the all these years? Point I'm, I'm I'm trying to make is I don't think you can have a parallel economy without significant support, theological support from the churchmen. Okay, so what, how what, how could we get there? What would that look like? Um, I mean, let's just take Lancaster County. Uh, there's there's lots of professing Christians. What would it look like to? I mean, you mentioned. Uh, property tax. I mean, what are some ways this could actually look? If you had, if you had your way, Joel, and you could influence, I mean, maybe just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. How, how could you? How could you start to actually have maybe a, not just a parallel economy? I mean, or one that would work. How how would it work? Yeah, sh sure. Okay, a couple things. On that. By, by the way, we just had a discussion with this on this uh, within our family, Luke. I don't think you were there uh, a, a day or two ago. And maybe maybe more than that. And we, we were talking about what is the biggest threat to the kingdom of heaven locally? What's the biggest threat? And I concluded, and you guys can disagree with me if you want, obviously. I conclude the biggest threat is the pastors are the biggest threat. Now, how can I, how can I say that or why can I say that or, or, or whatever? To answer your question, Chris, I'm going to go to Jeremiah 7 here. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Now, what are you going to do when you stand in the gate of the Lord's house and prophesy? Say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're failing in your PowerPoint presentations. Your, your, your worship team, you, you know, the guitars are out of tune. We've got to tune these things up. C can we get a tenor section here? Uh, no. I, I want you to hear what he has to say. He's talking about justice. And you can say, well, no, we're, we're, we don't, we're not in charge of justice here. That's, that's the king and, and, and his counselors. I want, you, I want you to hear this. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that enter at, at these gates to worship the Lord. So we've got the right motivation here. We're worshiping the Lord. What do you want? Jeremiah, Jerry. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Don't trust in lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, meaning, meaning that, hey, we're coming to the temple, so it must be okay because we're here at the temple. And Jeremiah saying, no, he's screaming, no. He says this, for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, etc. Now, of course, the people could have said, well, again, this isn't our department here. We're not the ones that are in charge of oppressing the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Well, the basis for justice is not the state. It is the church. It's the ecclesiastical authorities here. And I think I believe that's what Jeremiah is saying. So to answer your question, Chris, if I had it my way, I would want the churches to say, you know what? The churchmen, the pastors to say, you know what? We've got the loving God thing down pretty well. At least we think we've got a worship team in place, right? And we've got all our relationship to God stuff in play. We've got, we've got a hundred sermons on that. In, in terms of loving our neighbor, maybe not so much. That's what Jeremiah is screaming about here. He's not saying, well, you, you, you know, you, 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 you've got the love of neighbor down, so it's okay. He's actually talking about loving their neighbor here. That's what he's focusing on. Don't trust in the temple. The fact is you're not loving your neighbor. I would argue that in our churches here in Lancaster County and abroad in Pennsylvania and, and even beyond, what do we really know about loving our neighbor? If we love our neighbor, we will say to the state, you must stay out of your neighbor's business in every area where God says you stay out. You're not loving your neighbor. So I would say, in the short answer, Chris, pastors, 
get up there and love your congregation and tell them what the, the responsibility of the state is, what it is not. To your point, Luke, that's what happened during the time of the Reformation. It's not happening now, though. Mm -mm. And, and, you know, and, and the creeping state just comes in and in, and the pastors are like, you know what? I'm being left alone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this uh, in our upcoming conference, um, the, gospel, the, the, the gospel war with, with, with pietism here. So, yes, pastors, get up and say what Jeremiah is saying here in the temple. Luke, Start there. Yeah, Luke, tell me if you agree with this. I mean, this is my brief analysis of kind of some of the talking heads within, I guess, conservatism, Christian conservatism. And they're kind of disappointed with the GOP, the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, this didn't really work too well. These last election cycles, uh, it, it's failed. You're expecting this red wave uh, that didn't happen. and or, or maybe it did, and we just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the mindset is kind of like, okay, w we need to do something else. And it seems to me with some of these people, it's like, well, that's why they're drawn to to the Amish as an example. Hmm. Like we just, we, it's almost like we need to withdraw from the political sphere because the Christian influence there isn't working, but they haven't tried. They're, they're not, they're not applying God's law. They're just, they're just doing conservatism. They're just doing man's law. So do mm -hmm. you agree with that? I mean, it's, it seems like it's like, Hey, w we tried and we can't, we can't change the, the political landscape. So we just need to hunker down do, do the way the Amish, and then I don't know what the end game is, but they it seems to me they the, the Christians in there still haven't actually tried to apply biblical law to the to the civil realm. I I, I think that's accurate. I mean, the the homesteading movement that's happened over the last couple of years is evidence of that. You know, as um, what's what's his name? Um, who's who's the uh, who's the homesteading king? Jason Matthias, maybe? No, no, not him. Moody. Uh, uh Salatin? 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 Yes, Joel Joe Salatin. Salatin. Yeah. He he said I think in 2021 I think it was 2021 that over a million flocks of chickens were started in residential areas. Over 1 million were were started. And the state shut a lot of those down. <laughs> it, probably. Because I, they were in backyards and 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 they had legislation against it. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. Yeah, ordinance, yeah, you're not allowed to have chickens or whatever. Uh, I think that's true. Um, uh, the, um, the the struggle I get when I think about that is, you know, the, the temptation is to is to retreat and get away from government interference as much as you can. Which is what the Amish have been doing with, for the last two hundred years. Yes, right. But the problem is, um, you know, we have a responsibility to do something about tyranny, and we can't just run away from it our whole lives. And that comes back to the fight or, fight or flight question. Uh, which Christians keep on coming back to over and over I, I again. I don't mean to interrupt you, Luke, but okay, you just put your finger on something. I don't believe we believe that. We only have a, a, a responsibility to fight tyranny when it affects us. We don't have a responsibility when it affects our neighbor and not us. That's the mentality, it seems to me, that we're bringing right now. And maybe that's better said to, to Chris's question to me. I, I, I wish the pastors, the churchmen, would begin to fight tyranny when it affects their neighbor, when it affects their parishioners. But the, but it's not. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but I, I, that that seems to me to be the key. We only fight it when it affects me personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and even then, we we don't fight it the right way. Uh, I, I don't think we're very effective at, at fighting uh, against statism. I mean. The, the church, I think, is is perpetually a sleeping sleeping giant. Um, the spirit and the gifts are ours. You know, if we were to um, as as an institution um, to rise up and actually attack the real enemy and get rid of this worship is warfare silliness that's infecting our minds and pretend like we're fighting a battle when we're not fighting a battle, um, I I. I I struggle with the, the temptation is to retreat um, <clears throat> and to do what the Amish are doing and go buy a house in Montana and just try and live off the fat of the land as much as you can before the state comes and takes everything. Right. 
that that that's a huge temptation, and there are people who do do that. Um, and and but the, the 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 benefit of that is that you can still love you and serve your neighbor and be effective in the kingdom because you can do stuff like this guy's doing. He's giving meat to people who want meat without being affected by the USDA's you know uh, desire to regulate and control everything and make sure that we're not poisoning each other i don't know i don't know what they're doing but uh, you know his his observation is that even at the usda usda facilities they're serving people rotten meat and people are getting sick right and uh their big concern is you can't do it because people are getting sick and so and so the, the amish even in their desire to escape statism you still can love and serve your neighbor. You can still do it. And there are so many people who are effectively doing that. So it's, I don't think it's wrong to try and get away from statism as much as you can. I mean, it's not the basis for uh, America in the first place. Those people were, were uh, trying to escape uh, um, uh, ecclesiastical authoritarianism, the, the, the uh, separatists that came over here on the Mayflower. And you know, talk about a group that's been kicked out. I mean, the, the kicked out of England, kicked out of Holland, and, and now over here. Uh, so I, I do believe it's true that, that people are trying to escape it now, but I guess that's the step you take before you have to fight it. You try to get rid of it. You try to uh, escape it, and then it follows you, and then you're like, okay, well, now i got to do something about it. Yeah, right. at, the, at the end of the day, you know, we had, we had the Amos Miller thing here in Lancaster County, and I had a lot of conversations with Amish guys over, um, they're like, yeah, well, well you know, it's kind of like the Barry Dumas thing, you know, with, with driver's license. Some of us are kind of like, well, I don't know. I picked that battle, but, you know, I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad I'm not doing it. And <laughs> and, and they, they kind of had that mentality. They're like, well, you know, is it really necessary? I can go down to the wise market. I can go down to Giant and get my own meat. Do we really need Amos Miller to be providing, you know, meat that hasn't been dipped in whatever it is they dip it in? Yeah. And And so it was over the course of like three or four months that, I probably convinced a half a dozen people that it's no different than when they went to bat against the the public education. Hmm. I said, I said, it's no different. I said, you were all for it there. You're all for it when you don't have to, you know, that you don't have to send your children to, to, uh, to public education, you know, indoctrination center, but, but you're willing to, uh, they're all for what? For fighting against, for, uh, for battling, for yeah. battling that that battling arena, the state really. Right. They're battling right. the state in that arena. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the meat issue, nah, okay. I, I can go to Giant and get my meat. Right. I'm like, really? You, you want to go Giant and get meat that's been, you know, rotten and then and then dipped in some kind of, you know, solution that that makes it pink again and as he talks about in his video. Yeah. So they're, I mean, they're not really fighting on principle then, o only on certain things like that are valuable to their community they will stand up for but not on the principle correct of correct. Of, of justice and that's where we need to be i think like we need are we going to fight on the principle of justice mm -hmm. not simply what well let's not fight it if it's not you know that big of a deal yeah it's, i think uh, one of the problems is uh um the, the church loves to fight for justice um, and, and make a big scene about fighting for justice. But I think they have no interest in fighting against injustice. No interest at all fighting against injustice because they can't define it. Once you reject God's law, you don't know what, you don't know what injustice is. And the church has rejected God's law and they can't define injustice. So what they would do is they wait around for the world to define justice and then they start battling for that. Right. Uh, to say that, whoa, yeah, we can, we, we're fighting for justice, you know? Uh, and, and then, and then the, then you walk right into silly things like social justice and, you know, and, and, and somehow, you know, vaccines got tied into that. I don't know how, but it did. And, uh, uh, the church has a lot of interest ostensibly in fighting for justice they have no interest in fighting against injustice none at all because they don't know what it is well even in uh, this case you have man you have the man-made law against this this farmer and then what actually happened the state commits theft mm -hmm. the state yes. breaks god's law goes yes. in there steals his food and yes. destroys it mm -hmm. so joel y yeah um i'm going to disagree with luke here a little bit that the, the church uh, church wants to fight uh, for, for justice Luke, I would have to say the church, even now, is not fighting for justice. 
It's not actually fighting for justice at all. Well, it's, they're not. I never said they are. I said okay. they, they they love to take the idea. The idea. Okay, the idea of fighting idea. for okay. justice. All right. All right. Or, yeah. or this church are all about justice. You know, I'll, yeah. I mean, David Platt getting up there where it's all about yeah, justice. Right. Or, yeah. yeah. You know, but they're yeah. not fighting for justice. Mr. Gospel, right? If, if, you can't define, if you can't define injustice, then you can't, certainly can't right. define justice. Right. So what, what I'm saying is that, and, and you, might, you might have said this, I might not have picked it up, is that, is that we, we, we don't fight for justice at all. We appear to be fighting for something called justice. We don't actually have to fight for anything that's just. It's all an appearance thing, which goes back to my belief that you can actually trade. Um, you, you can exchange your basic uh, politician with your basic pastor, mm. and both could function just as easily mm -hmm. in, in, in each case. Oh, man. That's, that's true. <laughs> Swap them out. Oh, they dress the same. They talk the same. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. They have the same friends. Oh, my word. Yes, yeah, so we, we can do um, a term limits for both, term limits for pastors and term limits for politicians. I think we just trade each other's positions, right? And and who, who here believes that anything would be anything different at all? Mm -hmm. I sure don't. Right. Now, it might be better. It might be better. For who? For the churches? For yeah, might be better for the churches and worse for everybody else. <laughs> oh man, it's a sorry state we're in. Uh, yeah. So I mean, all this stuff's happening local. This is the other thing that just to think about that there's so much focus on the national race and the presidential stuff, and we have this stuff happening in this probably small county in Virginia, and of course here in Lancaster County, we have Amos Miller who dealt with the state, and we have Reuben King who who's now his sentencing is pushed to November fifteenth could go to jail for five years uh, again the state stole his weapons right he was selling shotguns and rifles and the state came in and, and stole them from him committed theft and now he might be locked up and again there's mostly silence from the churches on that well and and the um, that's one thing the amish church is going to be very silent on yeah oh, even, yeah. even they, they, they yeah. were willing to go to bat for schools Amos Miller, eh. yeah. Reuben King, no but way. Reuben King, we're not touching that with a ten foot stick. Mm. You know, we're we're. I mean, and and the majority of the Amish hunt, right? You know, yeah, they, they have guns. They have guns. So, but this is the thing. Like, even the parallel economy here, again, not to to pick on the Amish, but like, they're not they're not fighting statism. But like we said earlier, we mentioned it. They're not even coming together to help their own. I in I, this case, I, I do, mean, they do help them in other kit. But as far as you think Correct. that would help him, maybe, but they're not going to defend his actions. How would you say they're going to something like this? I mean, I mean, what what's going to happen is once he ends up, you know, locked in a federal prison, they'll take care of his wife and his farm. Okay, and, that's and, good. You know, they'll t they'll do that. Yeah, they're 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 going they're, they're and and they'll go visit him and they'll send him stuff and 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 he'll have it better than most people probably. Okay, uh, when it comes to that, but but one thing you know we're picking on the Amish. Uh, which I have no problem with. I think the Mennonites are ten times worse. Yeah, they just. Well, I, I don't no, think. Here, here's an old discussion. To, uh, why, why, why do you say that? Because I was ex Amish. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't All mean right. to pick on the Amish or the Mennonites because no, no, most the the um, the rest of the church is not only not speaking up about it, but they're not even doing anything else either. So, so the Amish they have this parallel economy idea, and I'm just trying to critique and say, well. Is that the model we want? No, it's not the model. Because we want. there's a lot of good things there, but it's not dealing with the root problem. And the state is continuing to grow. And if we say, well, we're just not going to be involved in in addressing the state with the gospel and with the God's law, the the we won't the Amish won't be around as as they as they are known now in in a hundred years. And and as long as we don't address the state, you're gonna have thugs driving U Haul trucks coming in and taking meat and, and throwing guns. it in the back yeah. of a non-refrigerated U-Haul van and hauling it Just to the dump. it away, yeah. Right. As long, as long as we continue paying taxes. Right. And that shows their resolve. That, that just shows the state's resolve. If, yeah, that's if, the key. That if, there was, I'm sure there was no homeless community, no food right. bank down there that they could have taken. They couldn't even meat. give it to their dogs. Right. I mean, well, that, I mean, yeah. I, I want I want my dog to have USDA approved meat. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's yeah, wrong with that. you? Why he loves his dog too much. I love my dog. I mean, what's yeah. going on though? To have to do that to be like I'm destroying this meat. What's in your it's head? Like a power play. Uh, the, the, the two guys that did that. What's in their head? Yeah, yeah. Like, what right. were they thinking? Yeah, right. While they're lugging out twenty pound, you know, I, buckets I, of meat. I, I just think I, I think what they're thinking is like i don't want to cause a problem i don't know i'm, I'm just i don't know i mean he should have done what we told him to do and so it's his, his fault hitler's and, brown suits yeah well i don't even see that the, the 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 brown shirts 
I think were were psychophants. I mean, okay. they 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 were like tried and true. I actually believe, and and I think independently of like being actually in a brown shirt, those people would practice Nazism okay, okay. outside. Um, but I think they were just the as that book uh, normal normal people or normal or, men ordinary men ordinary men. Thank you. They were just ordinary men. Hey, I'm just it's it's this attitude of um, uh, I, look. I, I don't want to make a scene. You know, I'm just doing my job. Hey, I don't know. I didn't make it. It's not my decision. If it was left to me, I'd let him keep it. But, you know, hey. Uh, you there's know, a law for that. Th yeah, there's a law for that. And we're a nation of laws, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But that shows the state's resolve. They will waste your property. They will destroy if it means they have to remind you who's boss. That They will do that. And that is not a government by the people and for the people. Yeah, that's. Ooh, slid that one in there. <laughs> it's it's so easy i mean it, it's it, it's so easy to point out a government by the people and for the people kills allows sits idly by or allows encourages celebrates the slaughter of 70 million children you know i i keep using a different number 60 70 80 pick pick it pick a number uh it, it sits idly by and that's the government that's by the people and for the people what'd you say last last week after the podcast comparing you know people talk about all these deaths in these other nations yes like uh uh you know the soviet, soviet russia yeah, yeah 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 soviet russia and and we're ashamed and that's the first thing we point out when we get into our uh owning the libs videos or you know as as, as uh you know has uh, socialism ever worked uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, you know yeah it has in this country well in that country they killed X amount of people so it hasn't worked and that same argument can be will be used against um, uh, the United States Lord willing it's used in the right way has constitutional republicanism ever worked yeah it worked in America wrong 60 million dead children do you think that's worked do you think call that a success you know that and, and I think uh, Lord willing 100 years from now there will be college students <laughs> trying to you know um uh, argue with people uh standing on a uh, at a lectern there and saying you know uh you know what we need to do is do america again but we just need to do it right and then there's someone up there saying well actually um tell me tell me a nation where uh uh constitutional republicanism worked republicanism worked oh it worked in america nope they killed 70 or 80 million of their own children in peacetime they're most innocent people that's not a success. In the same way that we point out the massive slaughter of socialistic countries, and this is a socialistic country, um, uh, we, we've been a socialistic country ever since the founding. Um, so, uh, I mean, in the same way that we point out the flaws and we measure their flaws by the killing of their own innocent citizens, and we say, I don't care about anything else, they killed their own people. That's not a success. We will be judged by that same measure. Uh, we will be judged by that same standard, and it's not going to look good for us. It's not a good look. I want, I want to pick up on that because, because in 2000, I think it was 2016 when Hillary Clinton was running, I had some discussion with some Amish guys, bringing it back to the Amish. Not that I want to pick on them. But <laughs> I had a conversation with an Amish, Amish man who said, this is absolutely awful. We cannot have a female you know, in leadership. You know, this is this is against God's created order. We can't do it. And so we got into the discussion on which is worse. I said, you're willing to stand up against a female in, in, in D.C., a puppet. But you're not willing to stand up on abortion. You know, you're, you're mm. willing to go to the voting yeah. to, to, the, to the booth, cast your ballot. But you're not willing to talk about abortion and how evil it is. Mm. Well, I mean, you know, I, how do we know when 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 a baby is a baby? Oh my! Oh word. my word! I actually, had, oh my I actually had that conversation. Yeah. Okay. But I actually actually was able to convince him that which is worse. You know that that abortion is worse. That shedding innocent blood is worse. So so that's part of the problem in the Amish community. The Amish community is not. It's not like they're backwards. They're not stupid. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just that these ideas haven't permeated their culture. Mm. Are and, the uh, let me ask this, Dave? Are the Amish a reflection of greater Christianity in that sense? Absolutely, they're no different than the, than the Baptist Church right down the street or the Methodist Church down the street. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I would have to say the the, the Baptists, the Methodists, and I mean a lot of Christian denominations, they have definitely made peace with abortion. Yeah. There, there's no other way to say it. 
It's like, yeah, they, they, you do it. It's, it's something we have to, we have to live with. Abor- they, they would say that. I, I would argue they would say that. Pastors would say, well, we just have to live with it. It's the law of the land. And, and those same pastors were probably offended that Hillary was running. They were probably like, hey, we need to get out there and we need to vote. Yeah. So that wh- right. who was she running against? I forget. Was it was Trump? It, Trump? it was Trump. Okay. Yeah, it was Trump. Yeah, it was Trump. Trump. So yeah. yeah, we need to vote for Trump. Yeah. I'm like you frauds. Yeah. yeah. You frauds. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 one of the greatest, I mean, I mean, everything that Christ said was great, but it has different, some of the stuff has different applications at different points. That strain of the gnat and swallow a camel quote works for an awful lot of stuff. You know, we're upset that Hillary woman is running. Oh, by the way, 60 million dead babies, whatever. Strain of the gnat, swallow a camel. And, and somebody can fact check me on this, but I read, I read an article that Trump did more executive anti Second Amendment executive orders than than Obama, and I, so so I went to an Amish guy in, on in that. half the time. I went I went to in Amish, half the time. Oh, wow! I went to an Amish guy on that. You know, it was, it was right over the time the bump stocks were being being I don't know executive ordered out. Well, I, I think that was an executive order, and uh, he's like, well, well, yeah, uh, but but Trump's done you know good things for our economy. I said, but 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 if he does good things for our economy, what good that would you know? And and our freedoms are being eroded. What good is that? Aren't we just kicking the can down the road? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I you know it, it's that it's it, you. What we're doing in this podcast is we've just got to keep pushing it. Mm-hmm. We've got to get it out there in front of people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just at the end of the day, it, it's a lot of these people have not been introduced to these ideas Mm-mm. well yeah the, the the amish community i mean the the conservatives have kind of tried to to co-opt or get the amish get the amish vote oh my they're, goodness they're like, we, oh my we, we goodness. need the amish oh. vote because yeah i don't know you want to say anything on that no, I, I got a lot to say on it but go, go ahead, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're... it's so frustrating it is so frustrating you got you got southern lancaster county where you got a fraud cutler down there in the pa house i had an amish guy tell me the amish only come out to vote in the fall and the packs the amish packs know it the you know the people that are getting them they need to come out in the spring because by the fall they're voting straight line republican they're not even considering who they're voting for yeah. it's just while well, he's in the republican we don't want the democrats in there right yeah you know, they're, so, they're, they're voting for the statists who will come and take away their their meat yeah absolutely yeah. i That's mean what's his doing. name i forget the guy's name he was running for yeah. governor i think he was he was the one that uh Oh man, I think he was involved in the case against Amos Miller as a Republican running for governor. These are the guys the Amish would vote for if they just follow this this mindset, vote Republican. And they're voting for the thing that's destroying their freedom. Yeah, we we can't have the Democrats, but this year's Republican is last year's Democrat. Let's be let's be realistic on this point here. The the Republicans trail the Democrats by about a couple of years and what where are the republicans standing up for example against this horrific transgender thing that's going on where are they and to your point chris where are the republicans that are standing up for uh, reuben king where right i, I don't know I, I i can't find them yeah yeah so in that sense you know i think it is a reflection of the larger christian com- community if you will and and now the the pull on the amish is to come over into republicanism to come over into conservatism um, and so they don't that they don't have the mindset of well the solution here is a full orb Christian society, and so I think they're gonna they're gonna lose their the good things they have they're gonna lose. I I do want to point out though that that this next generation I, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast this next generation it's interesting what they're watching, it's interesting that they're watching this type of thing, they're on zero hedge you know they're they're on. Uh, Lou Rockwell. So you get a lot, you got a lot, what I would call libertarian, Mm. young Mm -hmm. libertarian, young and restless and reformed. Maybe you could call them at some point, (laughs) but I mean, you got that. There's this itch in that, in that 20 to 30 range, 20 to 35 range Amish. Right. They're trying to find answers. Right. I mean, you've run into, you've run into a few guys like that. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and they're more than willing to talk. Right, right. Yeah, and there's nothing about this to say that, that the, the Amish the Amish are great people. The point is... Yeah, the point. The point, the yeah. point is that, that 
looking to that way of life and saying, hey, this is going to be the solution when that's not the case. Correct. Right. And I just want to read something real quick here as as we're running out of time. We still got a little bit to go. But uh, in, in the confessional county, Raymond Simmons says that it's not enough to just have this community like it's not enough to just be like well we're gonna we're gonna retreat we're gonna ha- be a separate community parallel economy and that's how we're gonna advance the kingdom uh he says that's not enough he says that that is good as far as it goes but the problem is that the civil government is still in charge of civil matters and resisting an evil government as an informal community has not boded well in history ask the huguenots mm. they knew that community was not enough They actively pursued and supported kings that would help them, and they even created their own political arm. William Henry Foote wrote an excellent book on the Huguenots. He writes, quote, The name Huguenot is supposed to mean confederate and was applied to those who leagued together or confederated to preserve their civil liberties against the encroachments of the nobles and the encroachments of the Romish church. There you have the the statism, if you will, of the church. King Navarre and the Bourbon line were on the Huguenot side at first, but once that line ended and Louis the... 13th took over the huguenots political organization was broken up and the political assemblies forbidden then they were on their heels and community was not enough given this history the huguenots would strongly encourage christians today to work for a godly christian magistrate especially when we see oppression on the horizon so that's kind of my main point we've we tried the trump thing we tried the mastriano thing it didn't work you know the only solution now is to this parallel economy and, and to come together as a community but we actually haven't tried a Christian magistrate. Like we ha- we ha- the, 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 the Republicans, the GOP, the conservatives, and, and the Amish that are being pulled towards that are not, being, are not being pulled towards a Christian solution. They're being pulled towards a status solution mm-hmm. under the, the guise of Republicanism. So and that's not just the Amish. It's, it's everybody in Lancaster County. So, but the point is the solution can't be, oh, we just need a parallel economy with no discussion of attacking statism. I actually think the Amish would be more susceptible to that idea than, again, the Mennonites. More susceptible they, they, to they, voting? To voting for a Christian magistrate. Oh, they'd be more, they'd be more uh, willing to they'd hear be more it. Willing, more, more willing. More inclined. More okay. inclined, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. I agree. I agree. They, they, they would be more inclined to vote for a... Well, because they're more inclined to vote, period. Correct. Right? Well, I still, I still have a big problem with the Mennonites. Like just let it all out. The, well, no, I mean, I'm serious. You have you have the Eastern University, <laughs> Eastern Mennonite University, is nothing but a communist hotbed. Mm. Goshen in Indiana, communist hotbed. Mm. They're communists. Yeah, mm. yeah, they are. I mean, that's there's no other term for them. Mm. They're communists. I, I, at least we'll say the Amish are not mm. communists. At least not going for that kind of nonsense. Mm. Like that's the that's frustrating good. part of it. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how 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 far you can go with uh pacifism and where it leads you in my opinion i I think that's that communism is born out of out of pacifism i I really do i think that's that's that was the um that that was the foundation for for communism in in those communities i don't think they were communists initially but i think if you keep on logically working through pacifism and and you and you live in america for long enough you have to become uh, you have to become a communist eventually. I mean, that's what the that's what the hoodle rights are. Hmm. You know, it's, it's it's that's voluntary, com- right? Well, well, it's it's voluntary in a sense. It's I, in I, a I, sense, but yeah, yeah, man, if you're born into it, you're kind of if you're born into it, you kind of are. But um, some people want to freeload. Now, see, this is why the hoodle rights make it work. Because if you want to be a freeloader, they'll kick you out. They don't take just anybody. If they think that you're not going to work. But that's what work, the communists did. Right. They, they just shot them in the head. Exactly. They shot the people. And that's the thing. Well, we want everybody to be welcome. Well, nobody believes in everybody's welcome. And that, that that's a lie. And and even these modern, the, the Hutterites. I talked to a young man who wanted to join the Hutterites in, uh, in one Goodness. of the Dakotas. Poor guy. You know, and, and you know what? <laughs> they gave him the old hefo. They turned him away. Because he said, you know what? I think, I think, I think you just want to be a freeloader here. Mm. Okay. Well, that's the end of you. Mm-hmm. But see, then, but then publicly, it's like, hey, you know, we're making socialism work. Well, didn't work for him. Mm. You know what the poor slob had to do? He had to go out and get a job. Get a job. Oh man, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> Look, do you, do you mean that that it's going to lead to communism be, if you have a society of pacifists? Because then the wicked will rise to power, and there's no resistance to it. Uh, I don't think that's what Luke I, means. I, I think theologically, theologically speaking, we can't fight. But somebody needs to, and the, who you left with after we, you left with the state. The right. church ain't going to do it. My family's not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. 
So who's going to do it? Well, it's the state. It's the logical conclusion. And and this is, again, going back to Thomas Paine. I don't know if you guys read his indictment against the Quakers. Did anyone read that? I did not. Oh, my goodness. It was so great. It was just amazing. And the, because the Quakers came out against Thomas Paine and, uh, I mean, against independence. They came out against it. And they're like, well, because we shouldn't be involved in politics. And Thomas Paine is like, and your statement is what exactly? Is it not political? You know, you guys are being such hypocrites because you're defending this king and, and all under the guise of being pacifistic. You know, and, and he said, but you're not being pacifist. You're, you're saying we shouldn't get involved in politics, but your statement is getting involved in politics. You guys are such a bunch of hypocrites. And he just totally just slaughters them. He just totally slaughters the Quakers. He said, and he said, you guys got a lot of good things going for you, but 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 you guys are such hypocrites because you're telling us we shouldn't be doing this. Um, uh, you know, and, and and he just he, he bring he brings up so many great points against the Quakers. And, um, but, 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 but again, there's the Quakers, the pacifists who, and when a push comes to, sh push comes to shove, whose side are they on? They're on the side of the crown. How, how different is that from today's churches though? Right. Not much. Your, 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 your non-denominational church down the street, yeah, your Baptist right. church, your Methodist church, they're in the exact same shoes. The exact same thing. They're doing the exact same. Hey, we don't want to get involved. And, and then when, but then they're when making people, statements. But when people do get involved, oh. guess they do. They, yeah, and then the Christians start to push back. Suddenly, they do get involved, and who, guess whose side they're on. Oh, so so they, 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 that goes back to my, my point that pacifism leads to uh, statism. State, statism. Communism. Uh, communism. Because the, 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 the historically, that's what was going on so with the pacifists. The, so you got the, finger, you got, you got the finger on the hot button now, right? So you got the Anabaptists, you got the Baptists, you got you got almost every denomination in the U.S. that that's a pacifist. Hmm. That's pretty uh, much when it comes to oppression, when it comes to tyranny. When it comes to tyranny, they're, they're, they're pacifistic. Yeah. Um, what do you in, mean, in, like, in their like, like ideo ide their ideology? They're not going to resist statism. Or are you saying that they actually believe in pacifism proper? No, um, no I, th I think they preach one thing and do another. Their application is, is, is what they do. You know, they're, 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 I mean, up, up until a short while ago, we used to hear how wonderful the Chinese church was because they resisted statism. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they get their churches bulldozed. And isn't this wonderful that they meet in secret? It, it, isn't this great? Well, you know what? Ever since COVID, we haven't heard so much about that. It's it's going kind of quiet on how wonderful the Chinese are because the Chinese at least had to have their church bulldozed before they meet in secret, whereas we went right to right, right, right to uh, Zoom right as soon as a man dresses a woman uh, told us uh, to do so. Luke, I'm I'm glad you got on the uh, the Quaker thing. I tell you why it's it's just a personal thing. Uh, the Quakers just get away with everything in modern in modern literature. I mean, all you have to do is a Quaker. They're all about peace, and they just get away with anything. Well, they're, they're, Thank, I, I, thanks for uh, pointing that out. Well, they're, they're, their their history no more free free ride for them. I mean, uh, well, I mean, they, they, they credit where credit is due. I remember reading about Patrick Henry, and the first people to approach Patrick Henry about, okay, we're talking about a new government, right? Talking about a new government. Let's talk. Let's start talking about getting rid of slavery. The first people to approach him were the Quakers. They said, okay, you know, I mean, because they do call themselves a free society, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, that, that was one of the, so credit where credit is due. But, and also, you know, um, William Penn, you know, and, and his, you know, the, the, the Quakers were um, at least ostensibly uh, proponents of freedom of, of religion. Um, and, and relig religious which, which thought a, and you know historic yeah. understanding that his term historically they weren't trying to create a safe haven for Hindus and you know Muslims that's not what they were trying to do but I mean so credit was credit is due there the Quakers historically have had um, some good and positive influences on upon this nation however um, you know their trajectory uh, w when when logically played out was heading always towards statism that's just that's just w w where you headed if you become a pacifist. Okay, then as as a general rule, were they helpful? I mean, the, the net effect of the Quakers, good or bad? Oh man, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't. I don't know enough about. I don't know enough about them to say good or bad. Yeah. I'd say now bad. You I'd got, say back then there was a lot of good that they did. Yeah, I'm afraid I do. The net effect is bad because they weren't theonomous. Right. Hmm. Right. Well, that that takes us back to our, to our main point here that a parallel economy is not going to help if the state can destroy it. Right. Th th that's the key. It, it, and and the Quakers for for all the in good, fact, you're not even going to have a parallel economy, right? If the state can destroy it, yeah. You, no, you got thugs coming in with U-Haul trucks. Yeah. Right. You got thugs coming with U-Haul trucks. You got 
ATF agents and same thing with them. What are they thinking when they go and, and confiscate Reuben King's guns? So you can't have a parallel economy. You can't have a, a Christian economy. You can't have a Christian society if the state can destroy it. And the idea with the parallel economy is, that, okay, we're going to take dominion for the glory of God, but statism functions, and this is something you talk about a lot in your book, Luke, statism functions to prevent that very purpose. Man-made law and man, man-made government yes. exists to, to uh, attack the purpose that God has made us for. Yes. So Christian culture cannot coexist with statism or injustice. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the big error is in, in really looking to the Amish model. A lot of great things, but saying, well, this is going to be, this is how we're going to fight uh, evil in our day. And, and I don't think so, right? It, it's a war between statism and Christianity and God's law. And as one wins, the other diminishes inevitably. So that's why I think this idea of parallel economy it doesn't it doesn't work. You you can't have you can't have Christ's kingdom growing, at, and and Satan's kingdom growing at the same rate. Like one is going to take over the other. And we know long term as post millennialists, it's it's Christ's kingdom. But but right now, this idea of well we'll let the state continue to grow and grow and grow, but we'll just build a parallel economy. It's not going to work. And even at the very local level level, just something that kind of bothers me just as an illustration, is like, well, we're not going to oppose this pride festival, right? We're not going to go out there and, and oppose that and preach the gospel or call out the sin. Like, we're not going to do that because we're focused on building the parallel economy. Like, it's the same mindset that w whatever happens out there, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we celebrate sodomy on the streets. That's like, don't we realize that God's judgment comes because of that? You can't build a parallel economy if God is judging your county because of your open celebration of sin. So we got to get that out of our head that we can build a parallel economy and just let the state or the county government continue to do what it wants to do. It doesn't work. It will not work. So we need a change of thinking to say, okay, the only way you can have a parallel economy is if you have God's law. So I, I, I think I think Isaiah one, Joe. I think you preached on a Sunday a little bit. When, you know, one fifteen. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. How is our nation going to overcome that with a parallel economy? Right. True. True. Great question. Yeah, the shedding of innocent blood. We can't. We cannot you, overestimate. You, you, you have a, you have a parallel economy. Oh, we're not shedding innocent blood over here, but we're still we're still it's still happening in yeah. our nation. And that's Raymond Simmons' point. You, you might you might have to start small with a township or a county, but you can't. You cannot simply have, oh, we're a parallel economy, but while, meanwhile, our, our society is raising their fist to God, shedding innocent blood. It doesn't work. Yeah, I think it's okay to f try and do a, a parallel economy, but you know that's not the solution to our problems. You know, uh, I, I'm thankful for the many parallel economies happening right now. Um, I, well, what I'm, is a parallel economy, though? Like, I don't understand. Like, how, how can you ha like? It, well, it, obviously, Amos. I mean, Amos Miller and uh, Samuel, Sam, Samuel Fisher. Um, was serving and Reuben, his and Reuben King. And Reuben King, they were serving the neighbors for a long time unharassed. Okay. So that that's a, a good thing. Yeah. Okay. So that, and, that, and and there's other ways that you could do. I can buy. You know, I don't have to go to Amazon. I can. I can. Right. They're can bypassing. And, and they're bypassing the status interference. And and, and to me, anytime yeah, so you do that, that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a good thing to do that. But but the prop. The, but the point we're trying to say here, for anyone who may be confused, yes, it's good. What they were doing was good. Is it is a good thing to bypass status interference but it's not going to work long term if we continue to have injustice as the law of the land yeah you can't you can't just run forever from from status no, interference no uh anything else you want to add luke because we got to wrap up no that's that's all i wanted to add it's it is good to fight um and 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 bypass uh bypass the wicked and unjust laws that are are, are put into place um um it's it, it's a good thing what they were doing there is is a good thing was and is a good thing, but it's not going to last. We need to be thinking long term, and slapping a parallel economy band aid upon the problems of this nation is not going to solve anything. Well, what they're trying to do, the parallel economy, is simply the way the economy should be. Yes, like it should. Right. That, that should right. just be the economy. It should be a Christian economy where you right. have freedom to do these things, unless you violate God's law. So, right. of course, it's great to 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 do those things, but we shouldn't just want it to be parallel because one, it won't last through history. If you have wicked leaders, the, the parallel economies, the Huguenots, um, you know, the separatists in England, they actually didn't get kicked out of Holland. They wanted to leave, but it's not going to, because there was too much non-Christian thought. Like you can't have the Christian economy without 
Christian law, God's law. And, and that's, that's what I'm trying to say. I think that's what we're, we're all saying. Um, anything else, Joel, you want to add? State is thinking. We just have to get that out of our heads. Uh, let, let, me, let me do a little thought experiment here. I, I want you to lean in with me and track. Okay, all right. That, that, was, my, um, that, that, that was my audition to become a, a mega church pastor there. Lean in, track with me. All right, thought experiment. Failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big swing and a miss. <laughs> Parallel economy, good. Black market, bad. Right? Well, black market's a good thing, right? It's just people exchanging goods, right, without state interference. But we've been taught that the black market is bad because it's outside the purview of the state. But if we really understand the scriptures, then we'll understand that the state has no business. If I want to sell, if, if Mr. Fisher wants to sell meat to his neighbor, his neighbor wants the meat. That has nothing to do, zero. Uh, did you hear me? Nothing to do with what God has said is the responsibility of the state. But still, you know, we, somebody says black market, oh, that's, that's, that's really bad. But really, we're being, we're being chicken hearted about it. Yeah. Because the only reason why the black market is bad is because we can get punished for it. Like these, and the guys. state can't tax it. That, that's yeah. that, that's yeah. right. They can't get their their chunk of it. So the so the right. so right now the parallel the, the Christian economy in many ways is the black market. It, it is. Yeah. Because it we, is. Yeah, and, and it, it should be. And good for good for right. them. As long as statism is is reigning, if you will, that's what it's going to be. So, but, so we, but I mean, they're going to come in and hit you. They're going to come in. They're going to come and, through and the, the back door with the IRS. Yeah, they're and, gonna, and that's they're, the other they're point. They're going to audit you. Yeah. The state's going to audit right. you. Well, that's our point. You cannot exist long term without God's law. So, so you can't do it. Yeah. All right, well, we, we got to wrap up here. Uh, Joel might be able to stay for the after show. So if you're not a, a patron, go to patreon.com slash the Lancaster Patriot and sign up. You'll get access to the after show and a bunch of other stuff as well. I want to thank you all for coming in here. Dave, thanks for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, maybe you'll be able to stick around too, share a little bit more. I'm not sure about your Amish background. Luke, thanks again for coming in. If you, don't, if you haven't read, read Luke's book, go to Amazon, search The Sound Doctrine of Theocracy. All right. Maybe an audible book soon, I hope. Uh, Lord willing, um, hopefully um, by the end of this month. And you got to get translated into French. Yes. <laughs> Have you asked so. Bishop, uh, Bishop uh, Lamba Lamba? Lamba Lamba Lamba. I Maybe mean, he can do it for you. If, yeah, yeah, I'm sure he would. Yeah, he's, he's got all the time in the world. Joel, thanks for coming in. Glad to be here. And uh, don't forget, uh, folks, um, the Future of Christendom con uh, conference coming up. Go to futureofchristendom.org. All right. And pray for people like Samuel Fisher. Reuben King, even Amos Miller. I mean, he had to pay a bunch of money. Uh, these are men who are serving their neighbors, and they're being attacked by the state. And there are fundraisers out there, uh, Give, Send, Go's out there, stuff like that. So I Yeah, mean, there's one for Reuben King, givesendgo.com slash Reuben King. I think there's one for Mr. Fisher. I'm sure there is. And, and the, Reuben King, it's just going to be hard to get support for him. People love the food thing, but the guns, they're like, eh, why did he have to sell guns? But <laughs> serving your neighbor. So... Anyway, for more information about the Lancaster Patriot, go to LancasterPatriot.com. Until next time, remember, Christ, not the state, is king. So long. Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to that episode of the Lancaster Patriot podcast. If you have not done so already, please consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast app and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Well, normally the after show is only available to our patrons, but today we're making it available to everyone just to give you an idea of some of the benefits you will receive if you become a patron. So if you like what you hear... Head over to patreon.com slash the Lancaster Patriot. All right, welcome to the after show. Joel, thanks for sticking around. Glad to be here once again. And we want to follow up briefly on our discussion about the Amish. And again, a ton of good things about the Amish. The point of that was to kind of say, hey, there are really great things going on there. And people are looking to that and saying, hey, this is this is a, something we should emulate. And I think we're just trying to point out there's a lot of good things. But as with any group, there's some things that maybe do not line up with Scripture, and we tried to make that point that if you don't have God's law in the civil sphere, any parallel economy is ultimately going to suffer under injustice. So any, any final thoughts on that? And then I want to get your thoughts on, um, on just your interactions with Amish and even some Mennonite uh, people throughout your life here in Lancaster County and Berks County. Yeah, sure. It's a little bit like this. I mean, you know, it's it's very difficult to have a functioning economy. It, it perhaps can be done, but it's it's really difficult and it doesn't work like it should i'll give an example um i remember when i was a kid my father read us a book uh, uh called um i forgot the name of the book it was by a missionary named herman becker and he lived in china uh, prior to the communist revolution and it was just like bandits everywhere the word bandit 
was a word that was used all the time. And it was very difficult to buy, to sell, because there were constant bandits hanging around um, looking to looking to attack your profits. Kind of like bring up a U-Haul truck and take away your meat? Kind of like kind of like that, right? Those would and be so, bandits, right? Right. And so what I, I believe what happened in, in, in China was when the communists took over, the banditry just became kind of official. It, it, right. it, it got the, st- the, the, the stamp of state approval. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of, of the banditry, if that's even a word, going on and on and on in China prior to the introduction of the, uh, of, of the communists. So it's, you know, if we're going to love our neighbor and be good at it, and see, this is, this is where we have this problem, I think, in the, in the modern church nowadays, Chris. It's like, well, if we're trying to love our neighbor, if we want to, if we have the right attitude, that's all that it takes. No, we should work hard at making it easy and profitable and wonderful to love our neighbor. So that is, is, is what's happening. The, the, the Amish are good at loving their neighbor in this sense. First of all, they teach production. You can't have anything unless somebody's producing something. You know, this idea of giving the poor people money. Well, if you don't have anybody producing anything that's worth consuming, what good is the money? You're not going to be able to buy anything with it. I remember Hurricane Katrina, right? It's like, oh, well, let's just give these people a debit card, right? Right. Well, there was nothing to buy. It was the uh, private profit-making industries like Lowe's, Home Depot, that worked. I, I remember this. They worked hard to open up their stores again so people could have some, something to buy. But you can't have anything to buy unless you have people who are willing to produce. So right. give the Amish credit. They understand production. They certainly understand work as far as that's concerned. Yeah, yeah. I want to say something about that. Uh, we had an experience this past weekend where, uh, and you know about it, where our plum- we had a big plumbing issue. And... I was able to, it was a Saturday, so a lot of stuff were closed, but I was able to, it's amazing what we can do when you have uh, people serving their neighbors, right? Like, I mean, I could, within a matter of a few hours, I could get someone out there to to pump out our septic tank and clear the line that was clogged and someone else to deliver a porta potty because we we're having a lot of people over. Like within a matter of a couple hours, I was just you know amazed at, and when you have the government come in and try to regulate things, and and it gives you less options. There were so many options. I mean, I called several places were closed, but eventually I got through to people, and they're willing to serve me. And yeah, it cost me money. It cost me extra because it was Saturday, but I was willing to pay it. I was happy to pay it because I wanted the problem solved. And it was there's competition. There's there's and so these businesses. My wife and I were talking about these business. Like, should businesses be taxed? Absolutely not. Like that does not serve. The people, right? That's the idea. Oh, we need to tax these businesses because, uh, you know, they're greedy and they're benefiting from it. It's like, no, don't tax them because the more you tax them, it's going to cost me more when I need them, but they might not be able to afford that shiny truck to come out and clear my septic tank. Like the, the businessmen serve our neighbors. And if we, if we tax them and regulate them, we are hurting the people that benefit from them. So I I was just, it it was a neat experience. And I think some of them might've been Mennonite uh, that came out like, you know, they're serving their neighbor by providing a service that we'll pay for. And we just lost that, that idea that, that you talk about all the time, that that's serving neighbor. Don't you think, though, it would have been better if they would have been taxed like 50%? They would have come out and done a much better job for you if they were paying more taxes. Right. Yeah. No way. And, and then I'm sure the guys that, they're, that came out, they're getting an extra rate sure. because they're working on the weekend. I mean, I wouldn't want to have to do that on Saturday, but they did it for me. And of course they made money from it, but uh, if they weren't making money from it, they wouldn't be there for me to call them and say, Hey, I need you out here in an hour to, to pump my septic tank. Right. Like it's, a be- it, it, it's a beautiful right. thing. You, you, you both profited. Right. W- which with my understanding of, of the communists, they could never understand that they, they, they could never understand production. Maybe we can say it that way. They couldn't understand that the, the, the this field here can actually be an increase in production and both people can benefit. The producer benefits his neighbor, and his neighbor benefits the producer because the neighbor comes and pays for the production, which encourages even more production. Your basic status, your basic communists cannot understand that. It's it's a pie, right? And we're just all try, trying to grab our little piece of the pie, and no one knows how to make any pie because they don't understand freedom. They don't yeah. understand that more pies can be made. We can grow pumpkins around here and harvest them in the fall. Oh, yeah, we're going to be getting a bunch of pumpkin stuff coming up soon. I'm not a huge fan of it. You like pumpkin pie? I love pumpkin pie. Okay, all right. I, I can't stand squash, but I love pumpkin pie. Okay. 
I mean, pumpkin pie is not bad. Do you, do you like squash? Not, not, oh, my not, word. Not necessarily. Spaghetti squash. Was, you ever, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Beets? Oh, you ever have beets? I do like beets. Oh, yeah. oh. oh I don't. Yeah, I'll eat them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What's, what's, your, what's your favorite Thanksgiving? Item? Oh, man. Uh, you know, growing up, this is interesting. You know, uh, being a, uh, growing up in a white family where we had all this white privilege and everything, I still remember um, the highlight of Thanksgiving meal. It was the only time I got turkey. It was the only time I got stuffing. I still remember, uh, and I still love uh, the cranberry sauce. Right. Uh, uh, oh, man. So that was, that was just a favorite. And then, if we had, then we might have pumpkin pie and apple pie. Apple pie. That's what with, I'm talking about. With ice cream. Ice cream, cream yep. We just didn't have that. Yeah. Uh, Chris, it wasn't that we didn't like apple pie or pumpkin pie or turkey. We just didn't have the money for it. Right. And in my white privilege home. You know why we had the um, tur um, turkey most of the time? Because the, the company my dad worked for gave everybody a turkey. This horrible capitalistic. The uh, government forced them to do that. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. They would never have done it. Right. But if the government didn't own. make them. Yeah, government made them do that. Oh, it was such. It was such a wonderful. I looked. I look forward to it every year. Yeah. We're gonna have turkey stuffing, yeah. cranberry sauce. Oh my word. Yeah, Thanksgiving is my favorite meal. But that's why I could never eat the like get into the pumpkin pie because there's apple pie and ice cream. Oh well, I, <laughs> I mean, I it's just, not a perfect world. Can't have everything. <laughs> uh, that's I would I would take that over the pumpkin pie. But the other thing too with just talking about what happened this weekend, like and and the big store model. How many people did you wind up having over? Uh, I was probably like thirty ish. Okay, on a, maybe more with the kids. I don't know. Okay, you were there. How many? You think that's about right? I, I think thirty yeah. or more. Yeah. yeah, that's. I'm still sore from Ultimate Frisbee, um, but the, this idea of the big corporation, right? And and then the li the little guy, and when you get the government involved with all these regulations and stuff, the person that gets hurt is the small company because the big company they can absorb the cost. I mean that's why when you have minimum wage things, you're gonna have like Walmart maybe. I don't yeah, know they can Walmart pay for the thing. lobbyists. Yeah, they can pay for the lobbyists. They can eat the they can eat the 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 extra cost of minimum wage. You know, paying someone so that they can run the little guy out of business. They they can do all those things now. So the big and, and this was an example of when the big stores could not help me, but the little guy could. Hmm. So I called some of these like national, I, because I needed a porta potty because I didn't know if this plumbing was going to be fixed and I was having a bunch of people over. So I call these national chains and they're like, you know, they're, I mean, there's, I'm sure millions of dollars. They got the great website. They got all, you know, and I call them and most of them are like, well, no, we can't help you. And some of them was like $400 just for the extra delivery fee for, for the weekend. Four hundred dollars. I was like, man, I'm not getting a porta potty out here. That's just that's on top. That's just an initial, an extra fee. But then I called. I got a hold of some little guys who were like in the county in the surrounding counties. They're like, oh yeah, we'll we'll bring it out to you within a couple hours. And it was under three hundred. It was under four hundred dollars. The whole mm -hmm. thing. The rental for a month and the delivery was less than just the delivery fee from the big guy. The big guy. Like that. That's and and that's what you lose when you have government take over the the, the regulations and the, and the market like. I wouldn't have been served by my neighbor. They wouldn't have made money, and I would have, you know, could have been a bad situation there because yeah, we, we had a lot yeah. of pulled pork, and there would be no bathroom. Well, <laughs> but the, uh, that is could be a tough thing. But think about what you did also for your neighbor. I'm not just talking about the neighbor that came and helped you um, with the porta potty. I'm talking about the, the the neighbor that might be helped next week because that business stayed open. It became, it was profitable for them to to serve you. And they say, you know what? It might be profitable for someone else, and someone else might need that service a week or two or three from now. And you actually encourage your neighbor to stay open, which also made it better for your other neighbor who you don't even know. This is what people don't understand here about, about freedom here. You help people you don't even know because you encourage this company to stay open and serve their neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many aspects to it. And again, that, that, that's kind of, I mean, parallel economy, whatever you want to call it. But once you have statism come in with all these regulations, you lose that. And that's why America still has a degree of freedom because we had this Christian heritage and we had this idea that we should be allowed to serve neighbor. But the more we get away from that, the more we're going to have government regulation and we're going to have less and less ability to serve one another. Which is what we talked about earlier. Uh, Reuben King just wants to serve his neighbor, right. wants to sell him firearms. Uh, by the way, and, and well, no, let's stay away from that. Well, you know what? Um, the Second Amendment actually is uh, – we, we don't have a right to keep and bear food 
according to the Constitution. Right. We do have a right to keep and bear arms. Yeah. So, so we, we should actually be talking about the, uh, the Reuben Kings of the world, perhaps, before we talk about the, uh, the, 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 the Fisher or, or even... Um, Samuel Fisher. Yeah, yeah, Samuel Fisher. I mean, yeah. he's serving his neighbor food. Oh, everybody needs food. We don't need guns. Well, uh, you know, tell that to the framers, of course, and that's another story. But the fact of the matter is both are serving their neighbor. No, you know, Reuben King isn't, doesn't have a, a, out there in the, you know, by the street with his own gun saying, come on in and buy my gun. Right. People are in there because they want to be there. Right. And that goes what we talked about before with this idea of these enumerated rights. Because exactly. Well, we don't have we don't have a, an amendment saying that the government, you know, can't take your food or you have the right to have your food. But that's that's the problem with the system. And that was what we got into our discussion before with Travis. Great discussion, by the way, that if you once you accept man made now you need you need all these band-aids. Right. Okay, we right. got to slap on the Second Amendment because the state, well, we got to slap on now uh, another amendment. I don't know what we're up to, 28th, 29th, I don't know. But we need another amendment to say, well, you can't take, come take someone's food. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it never if, ends. Yeah, if they don't say that, then they can, I, I guess they can back up the truck and take away the, the, my, my food. Oh, and even if we had it, I mean, I listened to the Supreme Court cases, they would argue a way around it, just like with the Second Amendment, yeah. because you have this man-made apparatus. So, by the way, banditry is a word, Joel. Oh, good. Banditry is a type, this is according to Wikipedia, is a type of organized, tell me what you think this is, organized crime committed by outlaws typically involving the threat or use of violence. It sounds like uh, USDA. A bit, right? Yeah. How, how would the USDA be outside of that definition? Organized. How, how it's it organized. Be? It's definitely organized. Um, they use the threat or use of violence. They got that going for them. Yep. They got to bring oh, their oh, guns. Yeah. So I guess it would just be they wouldn't say it's crime and they wouldn't say they're outlaws. Yeah, yeah. They would say this is we're we're following the law and this is justice. Yeah, we're state sponsored, but yeah, it is just because the state says so. Yeah, see, I remember this is one of the reasons why I, <laughs> um, you guys, you know, might might, might want to strangle me here, but I, um, I, I I was against almost all movies, against almost all TV shows when my kids were growing up. I say almost. There was one TV show that I kind of supported a little bit. That was The Simpsons. Oh, my goodness. I was not expecting that. <laughs> I was somewhat of a Simpson fan. and the re I'll tell you the reason was is because I felt we could get, um, we could get more, get, get better life lessons from The Simpsons than you could from nearly any other popular show or even unpopular show and it, and this is this is how i did it okay um they, they had this one I, I forget what the, the the um what the deal was there but there was a discussion over whether or not something they were doing was right and uh homer and some other guys wanted to app apparently change some laws right and you remember reverend lovejoy there right he finished everything uh with uh with a with with an a at the end trying to sound articulate right and um uh, and, and so at the end of the show, they asked if what they were doing was, was right. They asked Reverend Lovejoy. Uh, he was, of course, you remember this useless, completely useless uh, um, cleric in, in, in the show, right? And uh, the, 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 the cleric, says, Reverend Lovejoy says, well, of course it's uh, okay uh, because you know uh, whatever is uh, legal uh, is uh, moral, uh, right? Wow. And that says <laughs> – yeah, what dad couldn't couldn't take off from that with a tr with, with a great um, opportunity to uh, teach the kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Um, oh man, The Simpsons! I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, he was the most successful TV father ever. I think. Right? Never left Marge. Oh wow! Right? I mean, that that's how bad. Never cheated on her. As far as we know, they yeah. never cheated on each other, and that's how bad it is. I used to say that to my kids too. I said, "You know what? What is the state? <laughs> oh what is the state of of popular parenting and popular um, family? It's really bad when the mo when the best example of a father and husband, seriously, on TV is Homer Simpson. That's how that's how bad we are. <laughs> oh man." All right, back back to our, our our topic here to wrap up on on the Amish and the Mennonite. Um, you didn't you don't you don't use Simpsons Simpsons analogies when you were talking with the Amish, did you? Not 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 hardly. <laughs> Tell me though a little bit about you've had a lot of interactions with Amish, and I I would say you've been successful in in many cases in in sharing the biblical message as it relates to 
Christ's lordship, postmillennialism, theonomy. Sure, yeah. H- had uh, in, in various jobs that I've had in the past before I was in the pastorate, and even now somewhat in the pastorate also, but um, I, I've had opportunities to speak with, uh, in fact, I work with a lot of Amish folks in my job when I was in the, in the concrete in- industry. What I found was that many of them um, didn't really want to talk too much about theology, but there were a, a good percentage that did. You know, some would just say, "Well, hey, I don't really want to talk about this. Is just the way we do," uh, um, and that, that's a phrase you get a lot of times. This is just the way we do. But hmm. others did want to talk about even what the, what the Bible had to say. What I found, Chris, was that they had respect for the Bible, but they. It, it, the, the ones that wanted to talk a little bit, they didn't know what was what was in it. And so w- when you – for me, Chris, that's one of the best scenarios. Talking to someone who believes the Bible but doesn't know what's in it, now you have a real a, a real teaching opportunity. And I had an opportunity to teach them from Christ's parables. That's kind of the opposite of a lot of modern-day pastors. I, I would say it is the, the they, opposite. They, they know, know what's in it. And they don't believe it. They, they don't believe it. <laughs> right. <laughs> And they purposely don't want to uh, want want to stay away from it. I mean, I, I've heard too many people that, "Wow, well, it's the Old Testament. We don't even preach that." What? Christ did. Paul did. <laughs> the The Book of Revelation has what three hundred references to the Old Testament. Oh yeah, it's the most Old Testament like referenced New Refer- Testament book uh, uh, yeah, uh, of all. Close to the Old Testament. Yeah. So you're yeah you know, talk about us. Yeah, it's like you're out of step. You 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 quote the Old Testament. What happened with me, though, was I worked with a, a group of people who were kind of Mennonite-ish, if you will. They themselves would have said they're not Mennonites, but they were uh, three aspects, Chris, I would say that are characteristic, at least of traditional Mennonites, a head covering, right, Arminian theology, and pacifism or non-resistance. We don't resist an evil person, Right. And so when I came to work with these folks, and I worked with them for, for a few years, maybe four or five, as I recall, um, there I was coming in to work with these folks, and they had, a, they, they had their, a, a church. Pretty much everybody that worked at this location went to the same church. And when I came, and they were pretty aggressive, and they wanted to convert me when I came because I didn't go to their church. They wanted to convert you to become a Mennonite? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yep. know that was... The, uh, people a are thing. active in that, yeah. Yeah. The, well, the, these people were pretty aggressive, and uh, which I appreciated. And so, um, yeah, a lot of the Mennonites want to keep themselves, but these these were, were different. They were like, hey, you know, let's let's get the Bible out here. And um, were they horse you, and buggy? They weren't horse and buggy. No. Then. Okay. No. Okay. They were. I tell you what, they were, Chris. They were kind of like um, <laughs> when I first knew them. They were like, you should have a dark car. Okay. It doesn't have to be black. But maybe a bright color car would just be too pretentious. Okay. And so a lot of, lot of rules going on there that were unwritten, if you will. But pastors can control their, their flocks that way with unwritten stuff. You just frown on certain things, right? And if it's not written or whatever, not ever talked about, then you just kind of figure out what's accepted around here if I want to come to this church. And initially it was um, we don't do the internet, as I recall. But that, that changed. Um, they, they, of course, could have phones and so forth and, and, and did business on cell phones and so forth. But that's, that's the way it was when I initially went there. So when I went there, they were pretty uh, aggressive when I began to, to work with these folks. And what would happen was we had, it had, a, had a half hour break every day. And um, during that half hour break, uh, food would be cooked up and we'd eat. And um, just talk about two things, Chris, two things only. Or primarily, I don't know if only, but almost only, politics and religion. And so there I was, your basic Calvinist, uh, post-millennial theonomist, uh, talking to <laughs> Arminian Mennonites. This is pretty close to your dream job. Pretty much. Which, which, I mean, you just only can only do it for a little part of the day. Now you can do it all day. I, I, that's exactly <laughs> right, and it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood when I get a chance to do these kinds of things, like now. And, and which is so enjoyable, which, uh, which is why I'm here so often, because uh, all Chris ever has to say is, hey, you want to do a podcast? I'm like, sure. I, I don't even know what it's about, but I'll, I'll find out soon enough. And so every day, Chris, we would do in this setting politics and religion. That's, that's, that's what we would do. And since they respected the Bible, I could argue the Bible with them, although we had problems with the Old Testament. This was a problem. And they accused me of believing in a flat Bible. I was like, what's a flat Bible? Oh, the, the, um, 
New Testament is just as relevant as the Old Testament? I, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's all the, uh, uh, let's see now. Oh, I remember now. The Word of God. Yeah. And so I would challenge them at some points. Like the Old Testament is like the Word of God Junior, right? This is Junior High Word of God, the JVs, and the New Testament is varsity. But what happened was because they did respect the New Testament, there were some that figured it out after a while said, you know what? The New Testament considers the Old Testament, the Word of God, and as authoritative. So, for example, I still remember this. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. We were talking about uh, pies earlier. Okay. So one day I was having a discussion with, with one of the guys there, and this, this young man was really, you know, he was into, into that church a lot. And he was telling me that the New Testament is superior to the Old Testament because in the New Testament we have prohibitions against lust where we don't have that in the Old Testament. And I was like, really? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Lust was legal in, under the Old Testament. But, but in the New Testament, Christ says, but I say to you, whoever looks at one of the lusts ever you know, has committed adultery in his heart. But that was brand new, not in the Old Testament. I said, well, um, <laughs> this, was, this was too easy. Um, you know, Anybody could have done this. I said, well, how about this? I said, how about thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, right? I said, we're not talking about our chocolate chip cookies here. We're not talking about a recipe for pumpkin pie. That's not, why, that's not why people cover their neighbor's wives. They go down the store and buy chocolate chip cookies. That's not why, right? And this young man, to his credit, he was quiet for a minute and said, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. It was prohibited in the Old Testament. And it was through this kind of discussion, Chris, day in, day out, which is kind of what we're trying to do here. I mean, we know this this takes time. The idea of God's law, which read Psalm 119 is such a wonderful thing, is meets with such hostility uh, in, in, in Christian circles. And that's what happened with me too. I mean, at first, initially it was met with, frankly, hostility. But by the time it was over, after doing this for a few years, and I still... <laughs> I say I, I still remember the day when it kind of all, all came to a head here. We were arguing about something actually in the New Testament, all right? And uh, it was in Romans 13. Okay. And w which, which makes sense, Chris, because if you reject the Old Testament, it's only a matter of time until you reject the New Testament. That's right. It, 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 it will happen eventually. Right, and one day we were in there, and I, I tell you, Chris, it used to get it used to get loud. It used to get no, the, it got loud it, with you. It, it was no. it was it was fun. Uh, it, in fact, uh, there would be even people that didn't even work there would come in and join in on the uh, on the arguments. Right, uh, who, who, who wanted to get in on it? And one day there were some other people in on it. Right, and they were pretty much all against me, which was which was fine. And. Um, um, but but what happened was over time, some people like really became sympathetic to the idea that the Old Testament really does mean something. Anyway, um, so what happened in this day was the, 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 pretty much the people there said, you know what, Joel, here's where we have a problem with you. You are saying that is it is legitimate for a a a, a person, anybody, to kill his neighbor, to kill another person. I said, um, well, yeah, um, there are some people that need to be executed. So if there are people that need to be executed, then there are people that need to execute. This is not rocket science here. Some even I can figure out. And I said, let me tell you what my problem is with you. Romans 13 says that the civil magistrate is a deacon of God, a diaconus. And I said, and you guys are telling me that a Christian can't be a deacon of God. That the very best, best person who's going to be a deacon of God, the civil magistrate, has to be an unbeliever. You want unbelievers to be deacons of God. I said, that's my problem with you, right? And then one of them, pastor, said to me, he was in that day. I still remember him a lot. In fact, I saw him recently. He said to me, well, Joel, I'm not we're not necessarily saying they can't be Christians, right? And I was like, oh, no, you're not, you're not getting away with this. We've been arguing this for years. And I jumped right down. I was like, yes, you are. You've been saying that for years. I've been in here. That's been your whole thing. If you're going to be a, a, a good Christian, you can never be a civil magistrate. Right. You have to be a pacifist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
right? And he's like, well, I mean, he's trying to weasel out of it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to let you weasel out of this today. Not today. It's not going to happen, right? And what happened is everybody else in the room, Chris, started laughing because they knew. They, they knew that I was correct. That is, that's been saying that for years, and you can't weasel out of it. Right. And on that day, I still remember that day. That was kind of like the end of it. We didn't argue very much. After okay. That. What else is there? Yeah, so th- those are mostly Mennonites, uh, right? Yes. Okay. Well, we, we've got to wrap up here in a minute, Joel. But you, would you say, though, you've had more success in, I mean, I know it's it's the Holy Spirit's work, but in changing people's minds uh, and, and interacting with the Amish? Is there more of an openness to... To change change their minds and their and their conceptions about scripture. Maybe just one story from that as we as we wrap up here. Sure, yeah, I, I have I have definitely found that to be the case. Uh, here here's what I found. I found in some Mennonite circles, in the plain Mennonite circles, and this is not a compliment, but I this is my experience. I've never been able to get into a biblical discussion with plain Mennonites. So I don't know. I mean, I, you know, every, every when I come to church on Sunday morning, I'm driving. I'm dodging a lot of plain Mennonite buggies and uh, bicycles. Um, I, I'm not sure what they do in their in their church services. For the Amish, though, I found it to be somewhat different. I would say uh, that on occasion, and it's not it's not that rare that I can run into Amish folks who, again, respect the Bible and will be glad to talk about it and discuss it. And I still remember one uh, gentleman that I dealt with. Um, he had a particular business and that and they used a lot of concrete for. And he would sit there and and talk to me and uh, about what the Bible actually had to say about business, about family. And I could tell that it was really resonating with him. What I, I think a sad thing is is the Amish have an awful lot of the structure without the foundation. They understand working hard. They understand production. They understand honesty. But I think they kind of see it as the way we've always done it more than this is what the Bible teaches. Right. Okay. All right. Well, anything else you want to add from anything we've talked about today? The only thing that I would want to add is to underline this idea of of production, of options over actual money. We think wealth is money. No. Options are wealth. In other, in other words, you had, you had wealth this past Saturday, whenever it was, right? because you had options. What if you would have been sitting on $20,000 and no one can come out and help you? Right. Your money's not doing you any good at all. That's but the great. options were what did you some good. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, the, and, and the wealth we have today, I mean, with, with cell phone and, and access to all these people, who, who are willing to come serve you. I mean, it's it's something that, you know, 500 years ago, a king wouldn't even have. No, not, no, no, and, and, no options like that. And that's thanks to the advance of the Christian faith. No which, question about it. And if you want to find out more about that, I'm reading through it right now. I got a hold of a book called um, The Victory of Reason, How Christianity Gave Us um, Freedom, Capitalism, and One Other Thing by Rodney Stark. He's, and, not, is he, he's not a... I, I think I, I think he started out as an atheist. I think he's now become Roman Catholic here, and it shows up. I, I, I he kind of defends Roman Catholicism a, a, a little bit, but he makes the point. For example, it, it, it is what he says. He says, you know what? He said the Chinese did come up with other things, like even eyeglasses. I, uh, was it eyeglasses or was it some other chopsticks. items? <laughs> it came up with chopsticks. He said, but it was only, he argues persuasively, as far as I'm concerned, persuasively argues that without Christianity, you don't have scientific advancement. You, you, you actually have opposition to it. And I, go, I know that goes against the narrative, but Rodney Stark in The Victory of Reason, a uh, thoroughly documented book, argues persuasively against that um, hypocritical revisionism, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, that's it for today. Hopefully there are some things to think about there. And um, we definitely need our neighbors to be able to serve their neighbors. And Absolutely. If, and if that's the idea of the parallel economy. Turn, turn them loose, Chris. Right. Don't, don't shackle them down with regulations and taxes. Turn them loose. Right. Amen. And that's why we maybe a parallel economy is something we can work on now. But ultimately, if the state can come in, if we can have banditry endorsed and authorized by the state, you're going to have a hard time serving neighbor. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very difficult. So, Joel, thanks for sticking around again, and uh, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll be back next time. Take care.